I am Agatha Wanderer and I am from the East Kingdom and I live in Enderward. I'm also the Baroness of Enderward right now. I'm a Laurel and mundanely I'm an art teacher and yeah, I'm obsessed with dirty old underwear. <laughs> so I have created a little, um, a short little slideshow for us to look at and um, uh, let me share my screen and I'll talk through it a little bit. Hopefully everything works the way I want it to. Dirty old underwear. So um, in 2012 or 2000, yeah, 2012, I was looking at uh, the internet. Uh, I had been in the SCA for a few years then. And I came across an image of of what looked like a bra. And I was uh, fascinated by this. So from then on out, I just started trying to make and reconstruct from one picture, this bra. Um, and <clears throat> a little bit of background on the Langberg finds. In 2008, uh, the castle was being renovated and uh, it was a computer room. This, this uh, castle is, currently being used as a, a facility for people, adults with um, disabilities who, uh, it's like a learning center. It is the room that was being renovated was a computer room and the floor had um, rotted and they need to, needed to replace it. So the rules and the laws in Austria are that if there's a renovation done in a historical uh, building, you need to bring in archaeologists. So archaeologists were brought in and the floorboards were pull, pulled up and beneath this floorboard, the ceiling below is like a, I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's got a, a point. Gosh, now I'm losing my, my, uh, my words. Anyway, beneath these floorboards, thousands of objects were found. And these are things, everything from linen scraps, linen thread, linen textiles, silk, wool, wooden objects, leather objects, you name it, it was pretty much in there. And those things have been dated to the 15th century, so the mid 15th century. Um, and probably the most famous object in that find is what we now think of as the world's oldest extant supportive undergarment that is not a corset, um, so a bra-like object. So in 2015, I was able to travel to um, the University of Innsbruck um, to work with the archeologists to inspect the Langberg finds. And I spent about 10 days there inspecting these objects and it was surreal because I never thought I would be able to do that. Uh, I wrote for the Janet Arnold Award if people aren't aware of what that is. It's a, an award that is you write for um, this grant and uh, you are given monies to travel and um, inspect and do research on Western clothing. So the image on the left is the extant um, supportive bra and the image on the right there is my reconstruction. And so people like, how did I get there, right? <laughs> so there are lots of images in the, um, the visual record that you can find of women wearing this garment, something like this. And once you see an image like this, you see it everywhere. I don't know if that's ever happened to you guys, like you, you're doing research on a specific thing, and then all you can see is that specific thing. Uh, and that's what I started to see. So I have included, oh, here, this is a really cool thing. Um, what you're seeing is the bottom hem of the extant garment. Uh, the eyelet edge is uh, here on the right. And uh, on the bottom edge there, you can see a couple of little threads. And that told me that there was something attached to it at some point. So it wasn't just a bra, like what we think of as a 1940s long line bra. There had to be something attached. And I uh, thought, well, that hopefully means there were skirts attached. So um, using that tiny bit of evidence, 
I continued on. So I have a couple of examples from the visual record. Hopefully this works. I'm a little nervous. It won't. Lots of you have probably seen this image. And if I could get my computer to behave, this is from the Shock Stable book. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and it is a 15th century Austrian manuscript. What you see here in the uh, image is a tailor inside what I think is actually a furrier's shop. And he's sewing what looks like cups in this garment. And that is the one image I saw and was like, aha, this thing really is real and existed, not just late. And it had skirts on it. Um, let's see if I can go back to my presentation. Here is another image um, of a woman wearing something similar. Uh, the top is not exactly the same. Obviously, we don't see two separate cups there, but we uh, it is a skirted, looks like supportive garment. It's from the same manuscript. And I have another one from the playing card. Um, this is from the Ambras playing card set. Lots of people have seen this image. Again, no two separate cups, but uh, a skirted, supportive, what looks like undergarment. So that is that one. Let me see if I can. So what we're seeing here is what we thought was another bra at the time in 2015 when I went to Austria. We put this thing on a mannequin thinking, well, this looks like a bra. And I spent two years trying to make this thing a bra and it just was never going to be a bra. What I found was that this thing that we thought was a bra was way too narrow. So the person would have to have a very narrow rib cage and very large breasts. <laughs> And there was no way that I could tell to secure it in place. So I came upon this image. If you look at that image in the bottom right corner there of uh, the woman wearing the headdress, I was actually looking at the gown she was wearing. And then I looked at her headdress and I was like, ah, oh, I think this is headwear. I think what we have is headwear. And there were some things about this garment. And I'm not going to show you all of the... Um, images I have because um, we haven't published everything. So this uh, at the top of that, if you look at the top edge here of this spraying panel, which goes down the middle, and it's really hard to see because it's old and dirty, uh, there is a spraying panel in here that runs this whole center length. This edge is rough. It's folded under and on the inside, it's just cut um, threads. And that didn't make sense to me that it was rough at the top where people might see that over the top of a gown or over the top of a smock or an underdress. Uh, why would that happen? It's also narrower here than it is at the bottom. And the bottom edge is much more decorative. The bottom edge has needle lace and it has a finger loop braid edge, which is pretty. And we thought, well, maybe it provided grip for the garment to hold it on. Uh, but we found that most likely uh, after experimentation that that and finding these images that that thing just could never be a bra. So uh, the birth of Mary image is the one that really got me zoom in on her, that's just a color image from the, um, the image over on the slideshow of this, what looks like a, a lace panel. We don't know if that's spraying in hers, but it's a lace panel of some sort with this sort of looks like long tails wrapped around. And so thinking about that and looking at the extant thing, it made sense to me to, to make that headwear. Uh, I wrote an article with, um, Beatrix Nutz called Enigmatic Beauty. And it was also published in a book, I think it's called Crafting Textiles. It's one of the chapters in that book. If you haven't seen this uh, article yet, it's on Academia. It's called Enigmatic Beauty, the Decorative Headwear of Langberg Castle. I wanted to scroll down and show you. So there's a little more 
there's more pictures there for you to see. So what this is right here is the finger loop and needle lace edge that actually goes along the face edge of the garment. This is needle lace that connects the main part of the headwear with the tails that wrap around and tie on. And then further down here, we've got images of, so we, we had to use drawings because of copyright, but images of people, not just women, wearing garments that are strikingly similar to the headwear that we um, were reconstructing. So if you're interested, go on over and check that out if you haven't read it yet. Next, underpants. So <laughs> these are the infamous underpants from Langberg Castle. And if we don't know if these were men's underpants or women's underpants. It's inconclusive. The DNA that DNA analysis that has been done was inconclusive. And uh, what we think, I've made two versions that you can see here. What we think was uh, the top version is the more accurate version uh, that one side was permanently sewn on with just a strip of linen and the other side was untied and tied in place. The shape on the bottom one is more accurate. I believe the underpants themselves have been patched many times, at least three times with different weights of linen, very roughly in just like a running stitch. I have opinions about underwear and underpants, whether or not women wore them. So we have some examples from the visual record here of uh, 15th century men. Sorry about the violent image here, but that's a pretty good one of someone wearing underpants, a man wearing the underpants. And then we have another one here. I think this is a woodcut. Solid on one side tie on the other. Again, a man. And then this one is probably the most famous image that we have of men wearing underpants, which is the Albrecht Durer men's bath image from uh, the late 15th century. There's, it, we can't really see the tie here, but uh, we don't think there's a tie here. We think it's just a strip and a tie on the back. Notice the headwear. Interesting. All right, so what about women? So uh, lately in the last year or so, I have seen more traffic about women wearing underwear. So this one's pretty famous. Uh, looks like women wearing underwear. Uh, this looks like a cross-dressing woman or a woman. Uh, this is uh, Semiramis and her son Minius. So this is sort of a um, a moral tale about um, who wears underwear. And it is thought that wearing underwear is a masculine thing and that women uh, did not. And that perhaps you had poor morals if you wore underpants. And I need to scroll down in this one to get to the one I'm looking at. This one is a world upside down image. So often what you'll see is uh, in some of these uh, manuscripts, images of women doing male activities and males doing female activities. And some people like to point out this image of a woman uh, putting on, and I don't know if you guys can see that in the right corner here, putting on underpants. But above her is a man who is spinning, which is thought to be a female activity. So. That's my opinion about underwear. I don't think women regularly wore it. And if people have questions or thoughts about it, I am so open to questions. But we can move on to uh, more extant objects. So this is a very fragmentary piece of um, textile, linen textile. It's very small. Uh, we think that it is part of a shirt. And what you're looking at is the neckline a little shoulder yoke and um, part of a, a panel, uh, probably a front panel because there's a buttonhole up here. And it probably would have fit a two to three year old child. It is the cutest stinkingest thing I have ever made besides I think the next thing, which is, oh, this is not it, but this is pretty cute too. This is an adult shirt. Uh, we used a, a couple of um, pieces, probably not from the same 
um, actual uh, shirt, it's possible, but these things were all just thrown into the vault together. So we're not sure. There are more than one set of cuffs in this find. Um, so what we're looking here at the top is the neckline of a, a shirt that's very, very similar to the child's shirt that we just looked at. This is the shoulder yoke neckline. Uh, there's a tie that's still attached. And the other piece is a cuff um, from a sleeve. So buttonhole here, button here, cuff and pleated um, fabric left over. And so I was able to extrapolate from the, not just what was left over, but also from other extant shirts that are um, in, in the historical record. Uh, and I found a few, if this works for us, images of people wearing shirts. I cannot zoom in that I know of. Let's see. This is a birth of Mary Saint, of course. And you can kind of see her neckline here and her pleated sleeve. And here's another one. This is a better image of a woman wearing a pleated um, shirt. Also, I think this is Austrian as well, 15th century. That's the end of my thingamajig. So that's it. <laughs> so if folks have questions or want to um, chat, I'm here. Oh my God, I have questions. I'm gonna be that annoying person. Do it, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so, so first of all, uh, I know there's somebody else, I noticed that somebody else is named Clovis on this chat and I definitely wanna talk about that. Um, not during the chat, but I love it. Um, so, so two things I wanted to ask you is, is one, it, it certainly seems that when we're talking about underwear in the historical context, um, I notice, um, because my focus is on, uh, like, like BCE or first century CE, right? And so okay. there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, gym clothing basically that the Romans wore that people talk about underwear and I'm like it, no it was actually your workout clothes right because people seem to look at undergarments of history through a modern lens yes. and and I I, I would kind of ask if you wanted to comment about about that and about how you educate people and sort of lead them away from this idea of looking at underwear through a modern lens, especially because now you're TikTok famous. Right, yeah, that's one of the TikTok uh, videos I did. On, and uh, and then, go ahead. Yeah, and then the other thing is, I re I'm so interested in the vault. Um, and, and and did, did uh, when you're talking about the vault, I, 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 this isn't the first time I've heard about, um, clothing that has been found kind of shoved between walls and and i'm i'm wondering is is was it because the clothing got to a point where it was no longer usable and they were just like ah eh, we're just gonna throw it down to be um to be insulation at this point or um do we have a misperception about the wealth and availability of textiles where they were just like, well, we could reuse this, but meh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw it away and get something new. Does does, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I feel I feel that sometimes within within historical context, we feel like people were just clutching onto every scrap of clothing um, until it rotted off their bodies. And I I just don't know if that's true or not. I don't either, but I do have thoughts about it. So the first thing you were talking about was my thoughts about why I think, can you repeat the question? It was the discussion about when you're talking about any kind of historical undergarments um, yeah. from, from BCE to your time period, which is trying to educate people to kind of take off their modern lenses, right? Right. So the most common question I get, I get two very common questions about this. The first is what about chub rub? And the second one is about, is what about menses? So um, I think that uh, women wore, uh, we know that women wore 
uh, a, like a linen shirt or a, I call them a, a shift as, as their main undergarment. Um, now, this, this find is in a minor noble's castle, right? So what we're seeing here in this vault is not just the, um, not just regular, it is, there are some mixtures of like regular people's stuff, but it, there might've been servant stuff down there. We just don't know. Um, we do think that they were probably owned by the people who lived in the castle, obviously. Uh, so I think that wearing a shift uh, was enough. That was your underwear. Um, as you walk, see, I have, so, okay, I have to admit something to you guys. I wear modern underwear to events because of my own comfort level. I am a teacher and I am fairly modest and I don't wanna show off things just in case the wind grabs my gown or whatever. So I have not experimented with not wearing underwear at an event and how, it, how things would feel, right? And how, what would happen. Um, so, but I have talked to others who have, and they say that it is actually not a problem and that, but some people do experience chub rub. And I think that if they get that, that friction there, that some people wear braids. I don't know historically if they did that, but I think that um, that shirt would have sort of, as you walk and as you move, gone between uh, your legs as you walk and sort of prevented some of that. If you've ever walked along in a dress, it goes between your legs. Um, menses. I think that women wore something obviously during menses. They didn't just let things flow. Uh, you, like you said, textiles are expensive and precious and you want to sort of uh, preserve what you can and avoid ruining things that can't be washed like your outer gown. So I think women wore something like a clout um, held on with a belt and a clout is just a piece of fabric um, folded however many times you need to fold it with, you know, if you need to supplement more fabric, linen or wool even, uh, and it's belted on. So like loincloth style around your waist. Those are my theories. Now, whether or not they're true, I don't know because there's not a lot talked about in the historical record. I am aware of some rape cases in the 13th century uh, where people talk about braids being removed and it is unclear whose braids were removed. So we don't know if it was his braids or her braids. People want, often want to say that, that it was the female's braids that were removed for this, for the act. So that a lot of people will point towards evidence that way. But I don't know because it's not written around, uh, written about a lot in the historical record. But if anybody else has more information on that, I am totally open to it. Uh, sure. And, yeah. I, and I know, I know being um, early, like very like antiquity period, I've worn a sublingua coolum uh, at Pensick, which is basically a linen loincloth. Um, it's, it's, it's basically a linen T-shape of fabric that you wrap around your hips, um, wrap from like you, you fold it from your bottom, bottom up and flip it under and then your breasts are just bound. Uh, yeah. with, with a piece of linen. And I have found that to be extremely comfortable if I was working out. I'm not exactly sure if I would want to wear that all day. Um, but, but um, and it wasn't even considered underwear. I believe that was something, something that was your gym clothes, right? Um, yeah. I don't think, I don't think the ancient, like ancient peoples wore that, um, which is why I'm interested in, in kind of making that connection between antiquity and, and, and modern or, or, or later periods with, with what modern people think underwear is because it's not. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, if anybody's ever tried to manage um, going to the bathroom in all those layers and, and things and then trying to untie this thing, which I have, I've experimented with the underpants and it is for me difficult and awkward, and I have almost dropped my underpants on the floor of a porta putty at Pensick, which you never want to pick up again. So, um, yeah, uh, I find that they're not practical. Um, they're comfortable, like they feel good, but I don't think they're practical uh, for my own use. 
Hey, yeah. I see Marion's here. And yeah, then, and, and then, could you talk about this? Could you talk about this idea about this vault that all this clothing, all this clothing was found in? Like, do, do you is your opinion that it was basically just a trash pit where people were like, "Eh, I can't repurpose this. It's too rotted out for me to keep wearing, so I'm just gonna like throw it down this pit, and maybe it'll be insulation for the castle." Is is that the idea? Yeah. So um, imagine a um, the room below had a ceiling like this, right? Uh, so I can't remember gambrel ceiling, maybe is that what it's called? Anyway, it's, it's a, um, a ceiling like this. And then the, a, a floor was added, uh, at a certain point in the late 15th centuries, like 1485 or six, I think it was, um, added. And what probably what happened was there was actually an attic above that room at some point, um, before they added that extra story or floor. Uh, and they probably had stuff in that attic that was um, just stored there, cathedral ceiling. Yes, thank you. Um, and they just dumped all that stuff down in there. Now, the really cool, interesting thing is that any, like that, that um, supportive undergarment uh, didn't have skirts attached and um, it only, the, only the front was there. And um, all that's left of the shirts in most cases is the neckline and the cuffs. Uh, and I think that's because they were removing the, reuse, the, the fabric that could be used because it was precious. Uh, and so before they tossed it down in there, they cut or ripped off what they could use. Uh, and then what was left was just small pieces. So um, there wasn't, Marion, you could probably uh, chime in here. I don't think there was any large pieces of linen at all. That's cool. Are there are there other castles besides Langberg where you would find um, where you have found uh, garments that were just kind of like shoved into walls? Um, like I like Langberg was. Yeah, there's Tyrol Castle, right, Marion? Tyrol Castle had had a shirt, at least one shirt. So there are like concealed finds throughout Europe. Um, there's like a whole concealed finds database out of the UK and they've had some really interesting stuff there, um, uh, which has been one of them is like a, a boy's doublet and lots of shoes. Um, Beatrix did a, um, a paper on a farmhouse in Stams where they found all sorts of things concealed in walls and the attic and things like that um, like purposely concealed like they put right. them behind these walls purposely and i think right. they, there have been things found in chimneys and uh uh in yeah. in window sills like there was a piece a ball of wax that found uh in one of those yeah. too that had been used for um waxing thread yeah and that, so, so that paper is really an interesting thing as far as like large pieces of linen um no, that like they repurposed everything they possibly could. There may have been some large pieces of wool because there are some larger, well, there's a lots of tiny little fragments, but the mice and the rats and the moths got to them. So yeah. we do know that there were, there was a, um, a pair of woolen hose uh, in the finds, but now all there is just basically like wool confetti. Exactly. And, uh, like you know, shred. That, yeah. Shred. yeah. Yeah, most crazy. most pieces of textiles are small. Um, probably the largest piece is um, that the woman's um, the front of the woman's gown. There's also a shirt that appears to be sleeveless. I don't know if the shirt. There's another shirt. I think that's actually from a different find, the Tyrolean shirt that doesn't uh, it doesn't have a side seam. I don't think that's from Langberg. Anyway, um, yes. So. Uh, I think that the Langberg um, vault was uh, just stuff was dumped down in there as insulation. And they're so well preserved because it was dry. Oh, wonderful. That, thank, thank, thank you so much for answering my question. I hope I did it well. Um, <laughs> I hope I answered your question well. You, you, you absolutely did. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, anybody else? Have questions or mess I have a um, question. Comments? Yes. Hey, uh, so first off, thank you for all of your work on this. 
I mean, you both have just rocked it and are really changing things. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. So question, since the early aughts, I've been taking my four panel code RD, but more of a late 1300s and doing the long line. So, you know, it ends a couple inches underneath the bust and oh. one side lace, the other side lace closed, but no sleeves, right? And it's just fantastic for Penzik and Lilies because you can, you know, boost the girls up, give them the support they need, but you're not dragging all this extra fabric around. And I was curious if you have come across anything supportive undergarment wise for like that late 1300s European era. I personally have not, no, no. I mean, there's some images, you know, you see some manuscript images of women wearing like the bathhouse images you were probably familiar with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's also an, uh, a sculpture in Germany in a cathedral of a woman wearing something like you're talking about. It's like a, almost like a supportive, like a sports bra kind of a situation yeah. laced on one side with a skirt attached. Um, I've seen that, but I haven't seen anything extant besides the Langberg finds are really just all I've ever seen of a supportive undergarment that's not a corset. And that's um, not a modern bra, so it's kind of its own magical thing. And it's uh, it's interesting to see in the visual record as well, though, uh, and all the different versions of it. Uh, we just happened to get lucky and uh, find it, it was found. So yeah, yeah. Hope that cool. answers your. Yeah, it Can does. One little thing. Yes. Um, it's only been recently that textiles. Um, were thought to be of any importance whatsoever to archaeologists. It's true, yeah. And so um, I was once at a, a, a museum exhibit opening in Germany and uh, um, having dinner and with um, one of the people from the museum and her boyfriend is, um, there's nothing like them, well, anyway. So in Europe, when they are gonna have a building project in the city, they hire a team of archaeologists to come in and basically do a survey, right? So they, mm -hmm. they go in and they they sit, they take care of any finds that are underneath, they document them, they collect them. And so I was telling him like how excited it was to go see this tiny little museum in this nothing little town that had this amazing extant linen garment. And I was showing him pictures, right? Like, this is so awesome. And he looked at it and he's like, if mm -hmm. I found that on one of my digs, I that's just a dirty old rag. I wouldn't even save it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a it's a cultural change in the minds of the archaeologists that textiles are worth documenting, preserving, studying. It's not a, a long standing thing. It's not pots or beads or metal or anything interesting um, in the long term archaeologist. So there may have been things like that that just got thrown away because they were just scraps of rags. Right, right. Um, but also, like, there's lots of stuff that's being found all the time. And, you know, castles being, uh, <laughs> castles being renovated. So who knows? Mm -hmm. Next year might be your lucky year. Right? You know, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. To... Hey, this is, this is Clovis. Could I make a, a, a an add-on comment to that? Yes. So, so as somebody who really, um, so, so again, I, I said my time period is kind of antiquity, so BCE to first century CE. And so a lot of my textile um, access is from uh, grave finds. And in my time period, we don't know if those grave finds are, is this somebody, is this what somebody wore? Is this their, is this their Sunday, or are they buried in their Sunday best? Right. Are they buried, mm -hmm. are they buried in, their best clothes? Are they buried with the best stuff from their tribe? Um, or are they buried with things that they uh, wore every day or had every day? Uh, exactly. we, we just don't know because I'm dealing with prehistory where mm -hmm. nothing was written down. And, and so one of the things I find so fascinating about the Langbird find is, is that this was probably very clearly just, just day to day um, and, and something somebody wore and, and something that you could you could very reasonably make um, an assumption that this was this was um, everyday garb instead of um, ceremonial or or hey like I, I buried you in 
your best clothes. Maybe not even clothing right. you wear. It was just the best clothes of the tribe, right? We're just going to throw you in this egg bar dress. Right. Um, I, I, and, and so I feel like it within your time period, we see a, a little bit more um, assumably authentic snapshot of the time, especially because like after, after it, uh, um, after it, 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 it was used up and it, it was no longer useful, they were just like, well, now it's installation. Right, right. Exactly. The thing about the Langberg thing, the, the Langberg finds as well, is that um, often in grave finds, you things might be in situ. So you know that the thing that is up on their head is probably headwear, and the thing that's probably right here is probably, you know, a shirt or a gown or, you know what I mean. So the stuff in the Langberg finds, though, like this thing we thought was a bra. Uh, uh, it took us a long time to figure out that it it, it wasn't because of experimental archaeology. We had to yep. really figure it out. Um, it was the answer wasn't there in front of us. So that was interesting and frustrating and um, kind of a actually a fun puzzle. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I'm trying to see if I can find an image um, of my. Uh, I'll look for it. Uh, what I'm looking for is something that that happens sometimes with archaeologists, and and this is something that uh, is becoming more um, more, I guess, not common, but more um, accepted. Is that people who are reenactors who are um, very much into historical textiles and making sure that they are researching um, the proper methods and materials and techniques for a time period, they can offer a lot of um, experience and knowledge to archaeologists. And one of the things that Marion and I were able to do was identify uh, the gown. Uh, the archaeologists had the gown sitting uh, sort of arranged on a mannequin sideways. Uh, and when I, when she did that, she put it on the mannequin this way across the chest with this ruching right here. And if I can find the image, I'll share it. But then I like turned my head and I had this moment of, oh my God, that's real. That garment, that gown is real. And it's the pleated gowns from the, like the Austrian um, and German 15th century images. Um, and I'm going to look for it and see if I can find that and share it with you, unless Marion has it at hand. Um, no, so I don't. <laughs> Marion and I are working together on the Langberg reconstruction project, and I am dealing with the linen things, so all, pretty much all things underwear. And Marion is working with the, the gowns, and she's working on the women's gown, um, and the, it's not in this one, and the children's there's two children's gowns is that correct yes and... there's just two children's gowns yep yeah there was a question in chat is there oh. a pattern available for the the headwear or there is so if you go to the enigmatic beauty um uh um sorry uh article on academia um if I can get that up, I will link it in the chat. There is a pattern in there. Um, it's very simple. There's spraying in there though. So uh, if, you, if you want to learn how to do spraying, that's a, that's a whole nother amazing <laughs> craft that you can learn. <laughs> it's awesome, but it's, it's a thing for sure. But yes, the patterns in there, there's also a spraying pattern in there um, for people who want to do their own spraying. Um, I am looking for that image. Is while I'm looking, are there any other questions in the chat or comments? I had a quick question. Can I? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, are you able to speak at all to the um, cup seam construction on the bralette? Sure. What What is? Do you have anything specific that you uh, want to talk about about that? I was just kind of wondering um, if it was a different type of, in like a more flat build style that might be stronger 
get strength or if it's kind of typical simple closure with you know the ends tap down i was just wondering for strength and rubbing purposes it's so simple so it is a vertical seam um, the seam is done with what I would call spaced back stitches or um, half back stitches, uh, pretty roughly done. Um, it might have also been a running stitch that was done twice. It's kind of hard to tell because it, the seam is felled over uh, with a, a felling stitch. So it's very simple half back stitch or double running stitch with a felled seam right down the middle. And the seam is about 0.5 centimeters wide. That's a little felled seam allowance. So does that so answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. Sure. I have a question. I have a question about that. Sure. So so as as uh, a, a person with boobs, um, I have noticed that seam construction on bras or t-shirts uh, has an effect on one's nip knops and and have you found with that kind of construction um do, do you feel like there was any um i i know this is just a really weird question but i'm actually very curious is do you think like like comfort was considered or or what what was what do you think was considered in the specific construction of that seaming with the cups? So, um, I think what was considered was can we make this thing fit a boob? I don't know that comfort was really uh, a consideration. That said, um, I have made more than one of these uh, through weight loss and gain weight loss. Uh, I've made and worn them. And I can't feel the seam. And I, I wear them daily at Penzik and at every event I, I go to. That is my supportive undergarment. I don't feel it. Now, I'm not a big girl, uh, but I do have a chest and I don't feel the seam at all. There's no, it's so um, in place that it doesn't move around sure. and cause a lot sure. of any. Um, I, I feel no discomfort. The only that's, discomfort that's might be like around my waist if I've gained a little weight, but then you just loosen the the side um, lacings because I do like lace mine on both yeah. sides, um, and it's comfortable. Yeah, because uh, because with with modern gar garments, I'm sure anybody with the chest has worn the wrong garment that that mm. causes a lot of chafing and discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not sure if if people in in that time period would just have either dealt with it or have been like, no, nah, we're 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 structuring our undergarments um, to make sure that we're not uh, creating open wounds that will turn gangrenous. No, right? I I feel no discomfort. And if there are other people who've made their own and they have a different experience, definitely share it. But I personally have not had any problem. I want to share my screen. I did find that image um, of the, and I think it's okay to share this. Marion, tell me if it's not. Yeah, it should um, be fine. Uh, I just had a comment to make, to make about the, the construction. And that is that this is one extent example of what would have been like hundreds of thousands of garments, right? And mm -hmm. each one was made, um, you know, by a, a usually by a seamstress or uh, I don't think the men male tailors were making this it probably was a woman's um, a women's craft only um, so we don't know how other people made this style of garment because we just yeah. have one example of it one um, yeah yeah so there probably were multiple different ways of making the same one um maybe some people liked having their seams on the outside some people like having on the inside I, I have we don't know we don't know no oh. and this thing is tiny the original is very little um it it's i'm a tiny person and the, the one i have was actually an accident <laughs> um i mismeasured something on the back and so it's slightly larger than the original and it fits me but i'm little and the chest fits me perfectly and um whether or not this was worn by an adult woman uh and not a teenager 
whether or not this was an older woman, we just don't know. Um, anyway, this image that you're seeing here is the lining of a gown. And this is uh, one side of the uh, sort of the, the top chest piece. And this is a shaped uh, panel that gives you sort of that rounded bosom. And what you're seeing in the lower part is, uh, uh, and there's um, pad stitching, pad stitching, is that right? Pad stitching there um, to sort of keep the, that rounded shape in, um, in its shape. And down below that is um, pleating at the waistline. And so when the archeologist had put this originally on her mannequin, she had it turned sideways. Uh, but then I, I almost immediately realized what we were looking at here, and that was exciting. So just, you know, sort of that idea of, of uh, people who have experience constructing garments, understanding what they're looking at, um, and being able to inform and help um, archaeology. So I'm going to stop share. Were there any other questions? <laughs> Spring is my geek. Yes, mine too. <laughs> Feel free thank to you so I'm much for this presentation. Um, oh, yeah. I, I always love hearing everything that you're doing. Thank you. Did the Renaissance show a movement toward making underwear? Can you expand on that question? Do you mean like underpants or supportive undergarments or shirts? Because it could be any of those things, I think. <laughs> when does our book come out oh so I have a busy life and Marion has a busy life uh and we are working on it uh we don't have a um a publishing date yet for you uh we're definitely working on it my goal my personal stretch goal is to try to have it done by the end of the year but that's been my personal stretch goal for a couple of years now <laughs> so my hope is that we actually can um, get that done. Now, what was happening in the first couple of years was I was doing uh, experimenting on the garments, trying to figure out what they were, and we're still doing that. So um, it's, it's not an instant process. Uh, we do have some plans for some other things that uh, if you follow me or Marion, uh, you, know, you know about. So uh, we do have plans for things. <laughs> Supportive and I have, I have another ahead. question because I'm annoying. Not so so <laughs> so you have this really beautiful sprang weave sort of in the chest, like kind of between the cups. Could you I and and I know I know that the accent garment kind of hinted that there was a weave. Um okay. do you have any or 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 does your team have any? Opinion to suppositions on on why that was done. What did you think it was decorative or artist choice or or a more practical um, a, a more practical idea? Because I find I don't know I, I I find some of like the details of construction of garment construction like really interesting. And I found it was interesting that there was like this little like sprang piece between the breast cups over. Yep, <laughs> and there you go over um, just a, a, a solid piece of linen. Um, and like I said, I know that the garment that you um, originally looked at showed that there was something woven between. Right. So the extant bra or supportive undergarment has needle lace along that inner edge. And I'll go back to, this is my personal one that I made. So what you can kind of see there along the um, inner cup there is some needle lace. That's all that's left in the extant garment, right? So it's just, there's nothing here in the extant one. But if you don't have something here, this these edges gape open. So we don't know actually, if there was spring there or a solid piece of um, fabric, that was a little bit of extrapolation on our part and experimentation. Uh, the pattern is based on, I think that one is based on the uh, tree life pattern that the, uh, the, the headdress is um, 
pattern uh, is made up of. So I think it's structural uh, and whether or not there was actually really spraying in there, we don't know. Um, there are not really any images that I have found with uh, women with spraying in between, but there's also no images of women wearing something exactly like this. So it's, um, it's hard to say honestly. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to answer in the chat um, the some of the questions, how to follow me. So I am, I am Rachel Case on, um, on academia, academia.edu. And I am, so that's my mundane. I am Sinister Sewist. Uh, on TikTok. I have a TikTok. I'm left-handed. I had to learn historical sewing techniques uh, sort of backwards from how, what we think the typical sewist sewed. I had to teach myself how to sew upside down and backwards so that my stitches look exactly like the, the original accent stitches. So um, anyway, I, I, it was frustrating to try to learn some of these stitches by watching videos on YouTube where things were backwards to me. So I started my TikTok to start, to start teaching um, left-handed sewing techniques. So I am on, on TikTok as Sinister Sewist and I'm also um, on, on um, Instagram and Instagram. So we have, Marion, do you wanna speak to, uh, how to follow us in other ways? Um, oh goodness! Uh, <laughs> sorry, I I I was just gonna sorry. hop onto this. I was gonna hop onto this to like support Rachel, and then like you know, sorry because I'm like on solo parent duty today. I want did want to answer the question about the gown um, before I run off. Um, the gown would have been worn. Um, over the, the the Langberg bra and then a shirt over the top of that and then the gown. Um, and um, I can go into lots of reasons why, <laughs> but, but that's like a whole nother presentation. Um, on Facebook, um, um, I'm my main page is Mary McNeely, the Curious Frau. And then um, woodcutwardrobe.com is um, where you can find out information about the pattern. Um, I have thoughts on why there would have been a spraying piece right there across the top of the front, um, because um, it's a really challenging area to get um, a pattern piece to fit perfectly, um, like a solid piece. And also with the hormonal changes a woman goes through throughout the month um, with breast uh, swelling and so forth, the changes in the bust size, you want to have some expansion room built in um, uh, to put it. Like, I don't know how else to put it, but um, it's good to have some uh, some adjustments, the built-in adjustment space. So yeah. Um, so all right, I have to. I have Thank to you, Dave. It's been but, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Take you. care. Bye. bye. So um, I have shared in the chat. Uh, the um my social media information um you can friend me on facebook uh if you want to woodcut wardrobe is that special project that um marion was talking about it will be a pattern company and one of our, our very first pattern will be the langberg bra so that is our hope to get that out also in the next um several months um someone asked about uh was there a um, movement toward making underwear? I, I know I am aware of some Italian um, underpants that women definitely wore. And they were sort of um, uh, very decorative. So that was um, something that the upper classes probably would have worn. Regular folks, I think that um, underpants and underwear what is something that did not come along until much later. So that's my opinion and thought on that. And I hope I answered your question. Let me know if I didn't and that you want clarification. 
So anybody else have questions or ideas or thoughts? I'm here for you. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. She says, this has been great. It's always, uh, it's always to find another thing to deep dive into. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So when I realized I was going to do reconstructions for the Langberg project that we're working on, I, I figured out that I had to learn Sprang. And Sprang, it, I had a love-hate relationship with for a long time because it's so fiddly and I'm not a fiddly person. Uh, and if you're not familiar with what Sprang is, it is a, uh, it's a non-woven, um, or it's a woven sort of plating technique with no weft. There's only warp and you twist threads to get patterns and it is quite stretchy. So this is one of my headdresses that uh, I have here on my little mannequin guy. Um, so I figuring out that deep dive and that I would definitely have to learn Sprang was not something I looked forward to, but now I love it because it's like a puzzle trying to, you see this thing coming out. It's like knitting, you know, when you're knitting something new or crocheting something new and you're trying a new pattern and you see it coming out. It's amazing. It's, it gets those little, it tickles your brains. Feels so good. <laughs> Oh, glad. I'm glad. I'm really glad people have enjoyed this. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I've missed. Um, did I show you the little shirt? I have the, okay, maybe I can talk about like my process. So what got me into this project was not only just finding this um, thing on the internet back in 2012, but um, uh, I just, I'm a very curious person. So this is my very first one. So you can see where I started. Like it's not, it's not perfect. And this is needle lace and it's kind of not awesome. And it doesn't have a skirt on it because I did not know what I was doing. Right. And there were two layers to everything, but the archeologist contacted me after she saw my um, blog post and she says, oh, really good start, but here are some things that you did wrong. <laughs> she was very like open, like she's Austrian. So she's very pragmatic. And she's like, here's what you did wrong. Here's what you did right. Looks good, but blah, blah, blah. So I tucked that back in the back of my head and I, I kept her email. And then I wrote for the Janet Arnold Award. And I'm so glad I did because these things take you down rabbit holes. It's amazing. Here's also my first pair of underpants. They're huge. The excellent ones are not this big. They're tiny. Let me see if I can find them. So these are directly made from, like, look how tiny they are. Now they fit me, but they sit very low and they barely cover everything. Um, and I think that's from the images you probably saw that um, they, don't, they don't fit like um, stretchy underpants that we're used to. So. But you can see London and France. Yeah. <laughs> yes so the this project is it was not instant it was a major learning um there was a learning curve trying to figure things out and it was a big puzzle and it continues to be a big puzzle so <laughs> did anybody else i i heard uh someone had unmuted did anybody else have something they wanted to ask or add no i i I, I'm fascinated by everything you do. I'm, I'm massively fangirling all over you right now. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, this thank has you. been so, so cool. Um, and thank I you for answering all of my questions. Like it's, it's been really awesome. Of course. Thank Can you. I ask a question? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to type, but I've got, there's something wrong with my keyboard. No worries. Uh, what was you said there was the cutest thing and it wasn't in the presentation after all what was that it was a little baby's shirt and all that was left of the extant shirt was a little bit of a neckline and this is what we made what we got from it it's just this tiny little thing and it is made out of the most coarse linen the extant one very coarse but if you think about babies how much you have to wash their clothing um, 
that's got to last. And they probably had hand-me-downs. So this probably would have fit like a, I would say a nine month old, something like that. And, you know, sleeves roll up and you can roll them down when they fit them. So. That's lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and was that also sort of just found um, dumped in the, in the vault? Yes. Yeah, everything I've re reconstructed is was in that uh, in that vault, uh, and I don't think I've shown everything. There is at least one other piece of headwear that was uh, originally classified as a bra, that is also not a bra, um, but we haven't written about it, so I can't really share that yet. But it it was uh, another one of those. This isn't working. This is not working <laughs> things. And then when we realized. Oh, okay, that works now. Yep. So cool. Were there pictures taken in situ? Um, you know, not really. Like, so if you go to academia, Beatrix Nutz has written several papers about the Langberg finds, and one of them was the pre preliminary report. And there are images of the vault being ex excavated. It just looks like dirt. It doesn't look like anything because there were layers of dirt that they, they and hay and sawdust that they threw on top of everything. And once they got underneath, and of course there's dust from stuff going down under the floorboards, uh, for hundreds of years. So um, I don't think they took, I, I haven't seen um, images of things in situ. No, it was just the, the vault. The baby garment looks potentially expandable with modification of the bound edge. Um, yeah, and it only has one button because the um, the original had a little bit left here and there was only that one little button right here. So it was easily removable and put onable uh, to just get baby in and out of. So did I answer your question? Um, I can't remember who asked it. Sorry. Would it be all right if I diverged just a little bit and talked about sort of the um, later period undergarments that people were asking about? Yes, because I that's not my wheelhouse. So please go. Yes. So, and, and I feel relatively unqualified to talk about this, but I just want to share some things that have been dawning on me lately. And that is that um, Eleanor de Toledo, we know she... Uh, wore braids. It was described in her inventory, um, not as braids, but similar to some of the extant Elizabethan era undergarments, which we don't really know if those were for men or for women, but they look like things that the Italian courtesans were shown wearing. And that was very racy, therefore not common at that time, we think. Um, but both of those cultures had contact with other cultures. So the Moorish or Islamic cultures in Spain, and then also um, the Venetians were heavily exposed to the Turks, and that was very popular there, uh, Turkish coats and things like that, because it was exotic and ooh. And, but anyway, the, those underpants look a lot like the shawar, which we know came from Central Europe and, uh, or sorry, Central Asia, and were worn and adopted by women much earlier um, in the 12th century is as far as I've seen. Yes. Anyway, exactly. That's what I had to say is I think it came in from outside of Europe. I don't see any evidence that that kind of thing grew up within Europe. Right. Yes. I've had conversations with people who do Spanish um, uh, research and yes, they, they're like they're, everywhere except for Spain, right? <laughs> there right. was Spain is kind of an outlier because of the underwear thing, like, and other issues probably too but like yeah yeah underwear was uh was happening much earlier uh in Europeans Spain. were late to the party yes <laughs> <laughs> so someone just linked um oh yes my enigmatic beauty um article to the chat if you want to check that out so thank you for that <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, Spain is great, Olalia. You're right. <laughs> I'm I'm going to take off, but thank you so much for this. Thank you for coming. It's been great. Yeah. Okay. So if anybody has anything else, um, we can wrap it up or we can keep going. Uh, it's up to you guys. Um, so one thing that we can do is I can give you final words. I can end the recording and then some individuals that feel like they don't want their voices heard, maybe they'll be more willing to. So That's if fine. you have any final thoughts. <clears throat> uh, final thoughts are, thank you for everybody for coming. And uh, I, uh, we're definitely still continuing this project. It will uh, hopefully culminate in a book in the next year. Um, we're working on it. Life is a thing, but um, I hope everybody enjoyed and I'll stay around if folks want to uh, after the recording ends. <laughs>